The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book Six, Chapter Four. A Tear for a Drop of Water. These words were, so to speak, the point of union of two scenes, which had, up to that time, been developed in parallel lines at the same moment, each on its particular theatre. One, that which the reader has just perused, in the rat-hole, the other, which he is about to read, on the ladder of the pillory. The first had for witnesses only the three women with whom the reader has just made acquaintance. The second had for spectators all the public which we have seen above, collecting on the Place de Greve, around the pillory and the gibbet. That crowd, which the four sergeants posted at nine o'clock in the morning at the four corners of the pillory, had inspired with the hope of some sort of an execution, no doubt, not a hanging, but a whipping, a cropping of ears, something, in short, that crowd had increased so rapidly that the four policemen, too closely besieged, had had occasion to press it, as the expression then ran, more than once by sound blows of their whips and the haunches of their horses. This populace, disciplined to waiting for public executions, did not manifest very much impatience. It amused itself with watching the pillory, a very simple sort of monument, composed of a cube of masonry about six feet high and hollow in the interior. A very steep staircase of unhewn stone, which was called by distinction the ladder, led to the upper platform, upon which was visible a horizontal wheel of solid oak. The victim was bound upon this wheel, on his knees, with his hands behind his back. A wooden shaft, which set in motion a capstan concealed in the interior of the little edifice, imparted a rotatory motion to the wheel, which always maintained its horizontal position, and in this manner presented the face of the condemned man to all quarters of the square in succession. This was what was called turning a criminal. As the reader perceives, the pillory of the greve was far from presenting all the recreations of the pillory of the hall. Nothing architectural, nothing monumental. No roof to the iron cross, no octagonal lantern, no frail, slender columns spreading out on the edge of the roof into capitals of acanthus leaves and flowers. No water-spouts of chimeras and monsters on carved woodwork no fine sculpture deeply sunk in the stone. They were forced to content themselves with those four stretches of rubble-work, backed with sandstone and a wretched stone gibbet, meager and bare, on one side. The entertainment would have been but a poor one for lovers of Gothic architecture. It is true that nothing was ever less curious on the score of architecture than the worthy gapers of the Middle Ages and that they cared very little for the beauty of a pillory. The victim finally arrived, bound to the tail of a cart, and when he had been hoisted upon the platform, where he could be seen from all points of the place, bound with cords and straps upon the wheel of the pillory, a prodigious hoot mingled with laughter and acclamations burst forth upon the place. They had recognized Quasimodo. It was he, in fact. The change was singular. Pilloried on the very place where, on the day before, he had been saluted, acclaimed, and proclaimed Pope and Prince of Fools, in the cortege of the Duke of Egypt, the King of Tunay, and the Emperor of Galilee. One thing is certain, and that is, there was not a soul in the crowd, not even himself, though in turn triumphant, and the sufferer who set forth this combination clearly in his thought. Gringoire and his philosophy were missing at this spectacle. Soon Michel Noiret, sworn trumpeter to the King our Lord, imposed silence on the louts, and proclaimed the sentence, in accordance with the order and command of Monsieur the Provost. Then he withdrew behind the cart, with his men in livery surcoats. Quasimodo, impassable, did not wince. All resistance had been rendered impossible to him by what was then called, in the style of the criminal chancellery, the vehemence and firmness of the bonds, which means that the thongs and chains probably cut into his flesh. 
Moreover, it is a tradition of jail and wardens, which has not been lost, and which the handcuffs still preciously preserve among us, a civilized, gentle, humane people, the galleys and the guillotine in parentheses. He had allowed himself to be led, pushed, carried, lifted, bound, and bound again. Nothing was to be seen upon his countenance but the astonishment of a savage or an idiot. He was known to be deaf. One might have pronounced him to be blind. They placed him on his knees on the circular plank. He made no resistance. They removed his shirt and doublet as far as his girdle. He allowed them to have their way. They entangled him under a fresh system of thongs and buckles. He allowed them to bind and buckle him. Only from time to time he snorted noisily, like a calf whose head is hanging and bumping over the edge of a butcher's cart. "'The dolt!' said Jehan Frollo of the mill, to his friend Robin Pouspin, for the two students had followed the culprit, as was to have been expected. He understands no more than a cockchafer shut up in a box. There was a wild laughter among the crowd when they beheld Quasimodo's hump, his camel's breast, his callous and hairy shoulders laid bare. During this gaiety, a man in the livery of the city, short of stature and robust of mien, mounted the platform and placed himself near the victim. His name speedily circulated among the spectators. It was Master Periat Tortureau, official torturer to the Châtelet. He began by depositing on an angle of the pillory a black hourglass, the upper lobe of which was filled with red sand, which it allowed to glide into the lower receptacle. Then he removed his party-colored surtout, and there became visible, suspended from his right hand, a thin and tapering whip of long, white, shining, knotted, plated thongs, armed with metal nails. With his left hand he negligently folded back his shirt around his right arm to the very armpit. In the meantime, Jehan Frollo, elevating his curly blond head above the crowd, he had mounted upon the shoulders of Robin Pouspin for the purpose, shouted, "'Come and look, gentle ladies and men! They are going to peremptorily flagellate Master Quasimodo, the bell-ringer of my brother, Monsieur the Archdeacon of José, a knave of Oriental architecture, who has a back like a dome and legs like twisted columns.' And the crowd burst into a laugh, especially the boys and young girls. At length the torturer stamped his foot. The wheel began to turn. Quasimodo wavered beneath his bonds. The amazement which was suddenly depicted upon his deformed face caused the bursts of laughter to redouble around him. All at once, at the moment when the wheel in its revolution presented to Master Perret the humped back of Quasimodo, Master Perret raised his arm. The fine thongs whistled sharply through the air, like a handful of adders, and fell with fury upon the wretch's shoulders. Quasimodo leaped as though awakened with a start. He began to understand. He writhed in his bonds. A violent contraction of surprise and pain distorted the muscles of his face, but he uttered not a single sigh. He merely turned his head backward to the right, then to the left, balancing it as a bull does who has been stung in the flanks by a gadfly. A second blow followed the first then a third, and another, and another, and still others. The wheel did not cease to turn, nor the blows to rain down. Soon the blood burst forth, and could be seen trickling in a thousand threads down the hunchback's black shoulders. And the slender thongs, in their rotatory motion which rent the air, sprinkled drops of it upon the crowd. Quasimodo had resumed, to all appearance, his first imperturbability. He had first tried, in a quiet way and without much outward movement, to break his bonds. His eye had been seen to light up, his muscles to stiffen, his members to concentrate their force, and the straps to stretch. The effort was powerful, prodigious, desperate. 
but the provost's seasoned bonds resisted. They cracked, and that was all. Quasimodo fell back exhausted. Amazement gave way on his features to a sentiment of profound and bitter discouragement. He closed his single eye, allowed his head to droop upon his breast, and feigned death. From that moment forth he stirred no more. Nothing could force a movement from him, neither his blood, which did not cease to flow, nor the blows which redoubled in fury, nor the wrath of the torturer, who grew excited himself and intoxicated with the execution, nor the sound of the horrible thongs, more sharp and whistling than the claws of scorpions. At length a bailiff from the Châtelet clad in black, mounted on a black horse, who had been stationed beside the latter since the beginning of the execution, extended his ebony wand towards the hourglass. The torturer stopped. The wheel stopped. Quasimodo's eye opened slowly. The scourging was finished. Two lackeys of the official torturer bathed the bleeding shoulders of the patient, anointed them with some unguent which immediately closed all the wounds, and threw upon his back a sort of yellow vestment, in cut like a chasuble. In the meanwhile Perret Tortureau allowed the thongs, red and gorged with blood, to drip upon the pavement. All was not over for Quasimodo. He had still to undergo that hour of pillory which Master Florian Barbedienne had so judiciously added to the sentence of Messire Robert d'Estauvy, all to the greater glory of the old physiological and psychological play upon the words of Jean de Cumenet, Surdus absurdus. A deaf man is absurd. So the hourglass was turned over once more, and they left the hunchback fastened to the plank, in order that justice might be accomplished to the very end. The populace, especially in the Middle Ages, is in society what the child is in the family. As long as it remains in its state of primitive ignorance, of moral and intellectual minority, it can be said of it as of the child. Tis the pitiless age. We have already shown that Quasimodo was generally hated, for more than one good reason it is true. There was hardly a spectator in that crowd who had not, or did not believe, that he had reason to complain of the malevolent hunchback of Notre Dame. The joy at seeing him appear thus in the pillory had been universal, and the harsh punishment which he had just suffered, and the pitiful condition in which it had left him, far from softening the populace, had rendered its hatred more malicious, by arming it with a touch of mirth. Hence the public prosecution satisfied, as the bigwigs of the law still express it in their jargon, the turn came of a thousand private vengeances. Here, as in the grand hall, the women rendered themselves particularly prominent. All cherished some rancor against him, some for his malice, others for his ugliness. The latter were the most furious. "'O oh, mask of Antichrist!' said one. "'Rider on a broom-handle!' cried another. "'What a fine tragic grimace!' howled a third. "'And who would make him Pope of the Fools if to-day were yesterday?' "'Tis well!' struck in an old woman. "'This is the grimace of the pillory. When shall we have that of the gibbet?' "'When will you be quaffed with your big bell a hundred feet underground, cursed bell-ringer?' But tis the devil who rings the angelus. Oh, the deaf man, the one-eyed creature, the hunchback, the monster! A face to make a woman miscarry better than all the drugs and medicines! And the two scholars, Jehan du Melan and Robin Pouspin, sang at the top of their lungs the ancient refrain, Une art pour la pendade, on fagot pour la maggot a rope for the gallows bird, a faggot for the ape. A thousand other insults rained down upon him, and hoots and imprecations and laughter, and now and then stones. Quasimodo was deaf, but his sight was clear. 
and the public fury was no less energetically depicted on their visages than in their words. Moreover, the blows from the stones explained the bursts of laughter. At first he held his ground, but little by little that patience which had borne up under the lash of the torturer yielded and gave way before all these stings of insects. The bull of the Asturias, who has been but little moved by the attacks of the Picador, grows irritated with the dogs and Banderiras. He first cast around a slow glance of hatred upon the crowd, but bound as he was, his glance was powerless to drive away those flies which were stinging his wound. Then he moved in his bonds, and his furious exertions made the ancient wheel of the pillory shriek on its axle. All this only increased the derision and hooting. Then the wretched man, unable to break his collar, like that of a chained wild beast, became tranquil once more. Only at intervals a sigh of rage heaved the hollows of his chest. There was neither shame nor redness on his face. He was too far from the state of society, and too near the state of nature to know what shame was. Moreover, with such a degree of deformity, is infamy a thing that can be felt? But wrath, hatred, despair, slowly lowered over that hideous visage, a cloud which grew ever more and more somber, ever more and more charged with electricity, which burst forth in a thousand lightning flashes from the eye of the Cyclops. Nevertheless, that cloud cleared away for a moment, at the passage of a mule which traversed the crowd, bearing a priest. As far away as he could see that mule and that priest, the poor victim's visage grew gentler. The fury which had contracted it was followed by a strange smile full of ineffable sweetness, gentleness, and tenderness. In proportion as the priest approached, that smile became more clear, more distinct, more radiant. It was like the arrival of a savior which the unhappy man was greeting. But as soon as the mule was near enough to the pillory to allow of its rider recognizing the victim, the priest dropped his eyes, beat a hasty retreat, spurred on rigorously, as though in haste to rid himself of humiliating appeals, and not at all desirous of being saluted and recognized by a poor fellow in such a predicament. The priest was Archdeacon Dom Claude Frollo. The cloud descended more blackly than ever upon Quasimodo's brow. The smile was still mingled with it for a time, but was bitter, discouraged, profoundly sad. Time passed on. He had been there at least an hour and a half, lacerated, maltreated, mocked incessantly, and almost stoned. All at once he moved again in his chains with redoubled despair which made the whole framework that bore him tremble, and, breaking the silence which he had obstinately preserved hitherto, he cried in a hoarse and furious voice, which resembled a bark rather than a human cry, and which was drowned in the noise of the hoots, Drink! This exclamation of distress, far from exciting compassion, only added amusement to the good Parisian populace who surrounded the latter, and who, it must be confessed, taken in the mass and as a multitude, was then no less cruel and brutal than that horrible tribe of robbers among whom we have already conducted the reader, and which was simply the lower stratum of the populace. Not a voice was raised around the unhappy victim except to jeer at his thirst. It is certain that at that moment he was more grotesque and repulsive than pitiable, with his face purple and dripping, his eye wild, his mouth foaming with rage and pain, and his tongue lolling half out. It must also be stated that if a charitable soul of bourgeois or bourgeoisie in the rabble had attempted to carry a glass of water to that wretched creature in torment, there reigned around the infamous steps of the pillory such a prejudice of shame and ignominy that it would have sufficed to repulse the good Samaritan. At the expiration of a few moments, Quasimodo cast a desperate glance upon the crowd, 
and repeated in a voice still more heart-rending, Drink! And all began to laugh. Drink this! cried Robin Pouspin, throwing in his face a sponge which had been soaked in the gutter. There, you deaf villain! I'm your debtor! A woman hurled a stone at his head. That will teach you to wake us up at night with your peal of a damned soul! Eh, good, my son! howled a cripple, making an effort to reach him with his crutch. Will you cast any more spells on us from the top of the towers of Notre Dame? Here's a drinking cup, chimed in a man, flinging a broken jug at his breast. Twas you that made my wife, simply because she passed near you, give birth to a child with two heads. And my cat bring forth a kitten with six paws, yelped an old crone, launching a brick at him. "'Drink!' repeated Quasimodo, panting for the third time. At that moment he beheld the crowd give way. A young girl, fantastically dressed, emerged from the throng. She was accompanied by a little white goat with gilded horns, and carried a tambourine in her hand. Quasimodo's eyes sparkled. It was the gypsy whom he had attempted to carry off on the preceding night a misdeed for which he was dimly conscious that he was being punished at that very moment, which was not in the least the case, since he was being chastised only for the misfortune of being deaf, and of having been judged by a deaf man. He doubted not that she had come to wreak her vengeance also, and to deal her blow like the rest. He beheld her, in fact, mount the ladder rapidly wrath and spite suffocated him. He would have liked to make the pillory crumble into ruins, and if the lightning of his eye could have dealt death, the gypsy would have been reduced to powder before she reached the platform. She approached, without uttering a syllable, the victim who writhed in a vain effort to escape her, and detaching a gourd from her girdle, she raised it gently to the parched lips of the miserable man. Then, from that eye which had been up to that moment so dry and burning, a big tear was seen to fall, and roll slowly down that deformed visage, so long contracted with despair. It was the first, in all probability, that the unfortunate man had ever shed. Meanwhile he had forgotten to drink. The gypsy made her little pout from impatience and pressed the spout to the tusked mouth of Quasimodo with a smile. He drank with deep draughts. His thirst was burning. When he had finished, the wretch protruded his black lips, no doubt, with the object of kissing the beautiful hand which had just succored him. But the young girl, who was perhaps somewhat distrustful, and who remembered the violent attempt of the night, withdrew her hand with the frightened gesture of a child who was afraid of being bitten by a beast. Then the poor deaf man fixed on her a look of full reproach and inexpressible sadness. It would have been a touching spectacle anywhere, this beautiful, fresh, pure, and charming girl, who was at the same time so weak, thus hastening to the relief of so much misery, deformity, and malevolence. On the pillory, the spectacle was sublime. The very populace were captivated by it, and began to clap their hands, crying, Noel! Noel! It was at that moment that the recluse caught sight, from the window of her bowl, of the gypsy on the pillory, and hurled at her her sinister imprecation, Accursed be thou, daughter of Egypt! Accursed! Accursed! End of Book 6, Chapter 4